Nima Kiva Tetz, and it's my pleasure to uh, make a few comments uh, on behalf of EPIC, an organization that does very much needed work in terms of education and guidance of young people. <clears throat> so I've been asked to say a few words about education, chinuch, raising children particularly with difficulties or in difficult times. What are the principles that we need to apply to this area? Can't do better than look into the words of our sages. And Chachamim say, Let your left hand always push away and your right hand draw near. See what exactly does this mean? The basic concept here is the framework on which all education rests, not only children, students as well, Rebbeim, teachers, all master disciple, Rebbe Talmud relationships, parent child relationships should be based on this cosmic principle fundamental principle. Let your left hand push away, let your right hand draw near. We need to understand both of those and their order. Left hand push away classically means discipline. The left hand is the left hand is, is the side of power, gvura. That means discipline. Push away, that means discipline. The right hand draw near, that's love. All human interaction, all human activity fits into these two dimensions, these two modes, if you like. There's the mode of push away, discipline, boundaries, and there's the mode of love, drawing near. All that you'll ever do will be one or other or a combination of those two things. Let's begin with the left hand. Push away means discipline. Note that our sages begin with that. The framework of discipline comes before the love, not because it's more important. On the contrary, the love is everything. The only reason you're disciplining a child is because you love them. Obviously, the only reason Hashem disciplines us and gives us, shall we call it punishment, is only because He loves us. Obviously. Elam Chesed Yibane. Moshe Shapiro used to say the sole reason for having children and raising children is pure Chesed, not because you expect to get anything from them. That is the basic motivation for child raising and teaching. If you're raising children in the hope of getting something out of it, it's the wrong motivation. And therefore it's all Chesed, and yet discipline comes first. Why? Because discipline gives you the framework in which to operate. You know, people often say that discipline is important for children's character. But I'll tell you more than that. Discipline is also important for children's intellect. And the reason is this. Obviously, it's needed for character. Discipline means in imparting to them some sense of self-control, some sense of boundaries, limitations. It gives them security. It does many things. But it's important also intellectually. And the reason is that when you think about it, intellect is always bounded, always disciplined. Let me put it to you this way. How many right answers are there to a mathematical question? Maybe one. How many wrong answers? Many as you like. The truth is always bounded. The truth is always limited. Falsehood is unlimited. And therefore, intellectual discipline means being able to think creatively, breaking outside the box, being incredibly novel, absolutely, but always in paths that are true. And the truth is limited. And therefore, for a child's intellectual development, they need the faculty of discipline so that they can think in paths that are true. We don't mean to stifle creativity, not at all, but disciplined anyway. But perhaps more basic than that is what discipline does for character. First of all, you know that children are creatures of discipline. You know, when a child says to you, why do I have to do that? Why is that my bedtime? The answer is, it's a rule in this house. Once they're old enough to ask you why it's a rule, a rule in this house, it's much too late. And there, by the way, when they do ask you that question, when it is too late, no amount of explanation will help. Right? In, in any amount of explanation, every, any argumentation you, you give them, a three-year-old will outdo you in argumentation. You'll definitely lose the argument. When it comes down to final raw stacks, and they do ask you, and you cannot win the argument, the correct answer is, it's my house. It's my home. When you get married and you move out, you run your own home, you can do whatever you want. You can come to dinner without a shirt or in your smelly sandals, but not here. Here, no shirt, no dinner. Why? It's my house. You go to a Japanese house, you take your shoes off. That's the custom. In this house, you behave in a certain fashion, whether it's Shabbat, whether it's a uh, uh, dress, whether it's sneers, whatever it is, not because it's right, not because Hashem wants it, not because it's moral, but because it's my home. Of course, if a child is available to be engaged in discussion and reasoning, of course you should do that. So children understand that there are rules. You can break the rules, by the way, but only under control. Okay, tonight your grandmother's coming over, you can stay up an extra hour. That's not being worn down. Let me put it to you this way. You may never break a rule. Never break a rule because you've been worn down or beaten down. You do that once, be hopeless. 
If you do that, you'll never, you'll never establish your discipline again. You never break a rule because you are too weak to maintain the rule. Of course, you have to choose the rules appropriately. Absolutely. If you choose inappropriate rules, you'll never be able to maintain them. Age-appropriate rules. But once you've decided on a rule, and it's a rule in this house, you cannot afford to break it. You know, if you know children, you know, they don't even attempt to break rules that are unbreakable. There's no point in it. It's just a waste of time, right? Example, Rabbi Lerner, who's a wonderful uh, rabbi and therapist, a psychologist, he said he was once in a, in a certain uh, general store, a little Macaulay, where he was living at the time, happened to be in Australia. And he saw a religious woman walk into the store with her child, young child, and while she was doing her shopping, the child went and cho chose some candy. Right? Came to the mother, said, Emma, I want this. Mother looked at it and said, it's not kosher. Without a word, the child put it back on the shelf. Child took another packet of crisps, whatever it was. Emma, I want this. She looked at it, said, no heksha on this. Without a word's argument, the child put it back. Then the child noticed a Hasidic, obviously Jewish man come in, who went over to the kosher rack of candies and bought candies. Child then realized where the kosher candies were took a kosher candy, covered his mother and said, Im, I want this. She said, look, this is kosher, but we don't eat candies before lunch. Child lay down on the floor, started frothing at the mouth, holding his breath, going blue. Rabbi Lerner said he looked at his watch to see how long the mother would survive. 40 seconds, she bought the candy. What's the message? The message is that the child's not going to get unkosher food, no matter what he does. It's not worth holding his breath and frothing at the mouth and, you know, losing consciousness. It's not going to help. But food, candy before lunch, that's negotiable. And therefore, he's much more stamina than you. He can hold his breath till he goes blue, no problem for him. But it's a problem for you. And therefore, children know what rules are breakable. And if they know that your rules are unbreakable, you won't have to fight for them. They won't even try to break an unbreakable rule. But once the rule is potentially breakable, they will try to break it. And they're much tougher than you. And therefore, never break or change a rule that is the kind of rule that should not be changed. Children also seem naturally to understand that there's a framework of rules, when they're young enough, of course. I remember a case of an Israeli teacher, a very talented, very experienced teacher, working in a classroom of very challenged children, children with great difficulties. And uh, it was the second floor of the building, and a 10-year-old child tried to jump out of the window, right? Certain death. There was no way she could cross the class in time to get hold of him. But a very experienced teacher, without a moment's hesitation, she said to the child in a very stern voice, you can't do this. Where's your note from the principal? Child climbed down. He hadn't realized you need a note from the principal to jump out the window. And in that moment, she grabbed him. See, children understand that they're rules and they need to be rules. And therefore, that is the principle of discipline. That's the left hand. What's the right hand? The right hand is love. Drawing the child near unconditional love, no matter what they do and who they are, unconditional love. Unconditional doesn't mean you break the discipline. Of course not the contrary and you tell them clearly the discipline and the rules are because we love you no question about that we actually do both of those rather poorly in our generation we don't do the discipline well enough we are afraid of it we're too weak it takes a lot of energy we don't do the love well enough we don't make it clear enough to our children how much we love them they think we think the children take that for granted and get it naturally but they don't always so let's say it again discipline on the left hand side has to be extreme you know, I learned this from Ram Simcha Vassaman, who was a master educator. And uh, although he never had children, amazing. My brother-in-law, Dr. Bortz, once asked him, how did you become such an expert? With great respect, of course. How did you become such a famous expert in Chinuch when you never had any experience? Normally, people relate to their own experience. Ram Simcha said to him, of course I had experience. I'm not raising my own children, but I'm talking about how my parents raised me, Rabbi Chanan and Nizir Ebertson. That was the experience I'm talking about. Let me tell you about one of those experiences. Now, Simcha told us that when he was a child, maybe 10 years old, he was in the front room of his home in Baranovich when his little brother was with him, David, the only other one to survive the war. And their mother walked through the door with a little honey. Now, honey was an unbelievable delicacy. You're not talking about the modern world where children have everything. You're talking about a, a family where, you know, there were days when they had two pieces of toast and a few cups of tea a day. You're talking about incredible poverty in Eastern Europe. Mother walked through the door with a little honey, tremendous delicacy. They had a rule in that home, Rabbi Khanan's home, that if a child ever asked for something, he didn't get it. Amazing rule. I once asked Rav Asman, why did they have a rule like that? And he said, it's because we didn't have. Our parents wanted us to know, if we have, you'll get. But I know that there was much more to it than that. I know it because he told us in the discussion about discipline. So they had a rule that if a child asked for something, he did not get it. Of course, we could never sustain such a rule, but they had such a rule. 
The mother walked through the door with a little honey, and this little boy at age four knew that if he asked, he wouldn't get. So he drew a chair up to the table, sat down, and made a loud bracha shakal. What did the mother do? Rolchanan's Robertson, she went to the kitchen and brought him a glass of water. Now, if your child do, did that, you'd melt in a puddle of emotion. But they didn't do that, and they turned out the greats of the next generation. Now, of course, we can't apply that type of rule and that type of discipline. It would be abnormal in our generation. But we need to do the equivalent. How do we manifest the love? We need to make clear to the children that we love them, especially children who are acting out and say, you don't love me, you love him more than me. Children always do that. It's a cry for love. You need to kiss them and hug them. Of course, not when they're teenagers. They'd rather die than be hugged and kissed when they're teenagers. That's the big advantage of giving kids a bracha on, 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 on Arab Shabbos. So to come home from shul, get to kiss them on the head. Very nice excuse. But uh, you need to show them the love and make it clear and tell them. For mothers, I would say, probably the biggest obstruction is just being too busy. And therefore, you need to be prepared. You need to be organized and prepared. Wake up early. I'm sure you all do that. You do your yoga and watch the sunrise and eat your health muesli. Then you sit in each one's bed with a loving mother's touch and you wake them. Little, little preparation, little thought. On one day, you can emphasize one child. On another, you can emphasize another child. Organize with a neighbor or a friend to take care of part of your family so you can spend quality time with one child. It takes planning and organization to uh, manifest clearly the discipline and especially the love. And finally, let me ask this question. What do you want the child to gain? You're using your left hand and your right hand. You've set up discipline. By the way, how do you relate this to children with difficulties? Children who are acting out emotionally, religiously, not towing the line, going off, going off in general, going off religiously. I'll tell you a very important rule. The rule is you always insist on every single rule and every aspect of discipline that you can get away with. What you cannot get away with, you turn a blind eye to. Let me say that again clearly. Some parents think children are being difficult. They lose all semblance of discipline. The child can do whatever they want. No, absolutely not. Whatever you can maintain discipline. Let's say, for example, on Shabbos, the child is doing something inappropriate behind closed doors. But you can insist that in the fa presence of the family, they behave correctly. If you can do that, absolutely, you need to do that. What you're going to lose anyway behind closed doors, no worth, not worth insisting on. All you do is lose authority and lose the battle. But what you can insist on, no matter what it is, Here's the goal. You set the red line of the discipline you can maintain, all the rules and demands you can make, whether it's davening, whether it's bad, whatever it is, and those you're absolutely obliged to insist on. It's bad education. It's irresponsible to let the child do things that are negative. But where you know you'll lose anyway, you don't insist on those things because all you do is lose authority. I hope this is, this is clear, and it's a very important guide for handling children who are going through phases that are difficult. Let's finish with this. What do you want the child to gain? You're using your left and right hands. What do you want them to gain? And the answer is left and right hands. What you want the child to gain is the left hand of their own discipline, self-discipline, and the right hand of their own manifestation of love. Rav Simcha used to put it like this. He said, all you want a child to have is two characteristics, consideration and concern. That's all. Consideration, discipline. Mother sleeping, be quiet, don't make a noise. Consideration, left hand, holding back. Right hand, mother wakes up with a headache, take her a cup of tea. Get involved. Concern. Small child. Now the child is uh, playing with a toy. Consideration. Don't walk over and take away their toy. No. On the other hand, a child is crying. Take them a toy and give it to them. Whatever it is that's age appropriate, what you need a child to develop, all you need them to have is consideration and concern. Left hand self-discipline, right hand love. That's all they need. But the rest will come on top of that. Yes, they need religious education and they need all sorts of details, but if they don't have the basics of a balanced, developed personality, knowing how to control themselves, manifest discipline, which they learn from your sense of discipline, and, of course, concern. One and without the other is not good enough, right? If you manifest a lot of love, you could no self-control. That's a disaster. If you're full of discipline and have no love, you're just a, a, a brutal individual. And therefore, let's sum up. Educational methodology for a parent or a teacher Left hand and right hand fully expressed. Educational goals for the child, helping them develop their own left hand of discipline and right hand of love. With this balance between the two, and of course the real difficulty is the balance. Where do you say no? Where do you say yes? Very, very, very difficult. The guiding principle is you say no out of love. And a sensitive parent who loves a child will know exactly where to put that line of balance between the two. Right? Of course there has to be a balance. 
When the rain falls, it's a chesed. But if it keeps falling too much, it's a flood. And therefore there needs to be a limitation. And that's why the love needs a limitation. At exactly the right point to strike the right balance. These are some of the principles of child raising. I wish you epic success.